So as you can see from the front of the bulletin, today is Trinity Sunday, um, the first Sunday after Pentecost, when we traditionally celebrate the Trinity. The readings are typically more Trinity-centric, but I went off lectionary. I have a reason, though. It's so I did not have to write two separate sermons for my preaching final on Tuesday and <laughs> this sermon on Sunday. So, there's no explicit meditation on the Trinity, but there is something else. Something that rivals the intrigue of the Trinity. Sea monsters. My favorite biblical character, by far, is the Leviathan. I'm aware that this is a bold claim, as given that Jesus, or some other member of the Trinity, should probably be a future pastor's favorite character. But I like what I like. A mythical sea beast. The Leviathan is not just a fascinating creature, but also a symbol of the mysteries that lie beneath the ocean surface. It is mentioned just six times in the Hebrew Bible and once in the New Testament. Luckily for us, Psalm 104, verse 26, is one of those places. The psalmist writes, There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. Frolicking. When was the last time that you frolicked? Think about it. While we might sometimes behave as such, we were, unfortunately, not made simply to frolic. This is one of several points in the psalm where we witness God using pieces of the world for his own pleasure. God creates Leviathan to sport in it, makes the clouds his chariot, rides on the wings of the wind, and touches the mountains so they produce smoke. Each creature has a niche meticulously carved out for it. Cattle have grass, humans have wine, birds have trees for their nest, and goats have rocky mountains. Everything in all of creation is exactly where it is supposed to be and has exactly what it needs. What a world that must be. I like the Leviathan because the Bible is ambiguous about how we should feel about such a creature. In Psalm 104, it is described as God's frolicking playmate. But that is not the image we get elsewhere. In Psalm 74, God is said to have already crushed the heads of Leviathan. It's multiple heads and given it as food to the people of the desert. In Isaiah 27, we get a similar picture, but of a future occurrence. Isaiah writes, In that day, the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster of the sea. In Job, Leviathan is portrayed as a beast to be feared by humans. But in the sense that it is a quasi-mythical creature who need not be roused from its primordial slumber. So, which is it? Is Leviathan a frolicking, misunderstood sea beast? An already vanquished enemy? A fearsome sign of the end times? I think Leviathan can be all of these things once we consider how much we actually know about the creatures that dwell in the ocean. Let's reflect on this for a moment. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association 
reports that humans have explored a mere 5% of the world's oceans. 5%. This figure, when considered in the context of our planet's composition, should prompt us to question. With 70% of our planet's surface covered by oceans, isn't it crucial that we delve deeper into this vast, uncharted realm? Selfishly, I think the answer is yes, but probably not for any of the reasons that scientists working for NOAA urge further deep-sea exploration. I think humans have ruined enough we don't need dominion over anything else, especially not the ocean. I personally just want to know if the Leviathan, or other critters like it, are really out there. In actuality, I try to think about the ocean as little as possible. I love it, but from a healthy distance. I have boundaries. The summer before fourth grade, I was stung by a Portuguese man of war, a jellyfish like creature called a siphonophore. That's actually a colonial organism, not one organism like a jellyfish, but I digress. It was cool because the nettles penetrate the skin, so I returned to school with a badass scar up my arm but not so cool because it derailed the, wor the world's shortest family vacation. While I do not recommend getting stung by one, I, it taught me a necessary lesson. The ocean is not our home. Even in the 5% of it that we have explored, there are creatures too strange to comprehend. And, it has always been that way. In every geologic age, the ocean has been home to a myriad of crazy critters. If you don't believe this information based on my two years of being a geology major, just go check out the Field Museum. It does a much better job. We have evidence that these creatures exist because the ocean once covered giant swaths of land that is now dry. 100 million years ago, the Western Interior Seaway covered much of the central US, from the Dakotas all the way down to Texas. But we can't find fossils for things that are still in the ocean. We assume many of these exotic species are now extinct, as it is Earth's custom to purge the majority of its life forms every once in a while. But we don't know for certain. How could we, when 95% we, when of our ocean remains unexplored? Now, despite what you're hearing, it is not necessarily my contention that the Leviathan is an actual multi-headed sea monster lurking in the depths, waiting to spring forth at the end times. I'm not a biblical literalist, so this is not the point I'm trying to make. I'm simply suggesting that it could be real. And if the Leviathan really does exist, we should be terrified. Or maybe just in awe. Karl Barth writes about the ocean in his multi-volume church dogmatics. For Barth, God left the oceans on earth as a reminder of the chaos out of which the world was created. The ocean exists so close to us, is there for us to experience, to remind humans of the complexity of creation, of the chaos that once reigned. Not for beach vacations, but for perspective. We might never know what sea monsters are out there. In our current moment, searching for all of them, simply for the sake of knowing, 
is probably not the wisest use of our time or resources. But realizing that there are things out there in the depths of the ocean or in a galaxy far, far away, or even in our own backyard, is a realization worth coming to and one that scripture can provide us. The Psalms are particularly good at orienting us towards awe, wonder, and enchantment. I love the Leviathan and its role in scripture because it is weird and it's wonderful, but it belongs there. The world of the Psalms, like the world of all ancient literature, is positively enchanted from top to bottom. In our modern quest to know everything about the natural world simply for the sake of knowing, we've lost that. So, my desire to explore the ocean's depths is not to disenchant us further, but stems from the desire that it might re-enchant us, even just a little bit. My prayer for the world today is that we all find a little bit of enchantment in the ordinary or the unknown. The good news is, there's no shortages of places to look. Whether you seek marvelous deep sea critters, aliens from outer space, or even a previously unspotted bird next door, hopefully it reminds you that we are never without God, just often without the vision to see God's presence am moving among us and around us. As we leave this place, may we all rediscover a little enchantment. All you have to do is look. Amen.